far off, but I assume you can see the screen. If not, you can let me know. And I think we're about ready to start. All right, so welcome everyone. Thanks for coming at PPI Days Hong Kong. Uh, today in this talk, I wanna talk about the new GraphQL cost directive spec, how that can help you secure GraphQL or as a vendor provide as a solution to, to, secure, uh, to secure GraphQL. Uh, my name is Morris Matza. I'm the API Gateway Lead for IBM's API Connect and Data Power Gateways and uh, with some other companies around working on this spec. So for, the, uh, for this talk, I want to start by talking about what the problem is. Uh, spe specifically first, motivating why it's important and then talking about in detail what the problem is. Uh, finally, discussing how it's solved today by all the solutions that are out there. Uh, and which brings us to why we want to standardize it. What is the standardization? How does it work? Why is it better than what we've got in status quo today? And, uh, and what can you do to help yourself with GraphQL? All right, to, to start with the motivation, I want to go for about a year ago at an API Days conference, my colleague Jim Laredo presented this, this screen, uh, which is all of the companies who at the time were advertising their adoption of GraphQL through the GraphQL Foundation. Uh, and then he asked a couple of questions about them. He went through and looked at each one, which of these companies had public GraphQL endpoints, right? We're already talking companies that are publicly announcing their GraphQL adoption through the GraphQL Foundation. About 20 of them had public GraphQL endpoints. And then he said, the other ones, how many of them have public uh, RESTful open API endpoints? That was about 30. Uh, so then he asked the question, why is it that so many companies that are being public about announcing their adoption of GraphQL have, and, and have public API endpoints, nonetheless did not yet have public GraphQL endpoints? Uh, and I want to do something different this year. Uh, went, uh, last month, looked at the Fortune 100 companies just for a different slant of things and asked how many of them are public GraphQL adopters. I was a little more lenient than, than Jim's definition. Uh, not only companies with public GraphQL endpoints, I thought let's expand it to companies who are very public about all of their GraphQL, like, like Facebook, but, uh, but did not include that many, many of these companies that are not public about their GraphQL, nonetheless are very, uh, they're not secretive about their GraphQL usage, right? If you Google the companies, you will see that they have, uh, even the ones that I'm not listing have people who work for them on LinkedIn saying they work for this company, what they do is GraphQL. Uh, or even more uh, straightforward than that, they have they if you Google them, they they publicly list that they have job opportunities at their company where that job description is working with GraphQL. So they work with GraphQL, but they don't, but only these 17 uh, did I find real public adoption announcements of GraphQL. Uh, so the question is, if so many more of them are actually using GraphQL internally, why are only 17 of them getting to this point where, where many of them have uh, public GraphQL endpoints, uh, or otherwise at least not announce the major GraphQL support? All right, so that's the motivation. That's, that's the question here. We've found many, many companies that are public about using GraphQL who nonetheless don't have public GraphQL endpoints or even internal partner main GraphQL endpoints even though they are using GraphQL internal to their company, internal to their enterprise. Uh, and why is that? What's the problem that's holding them back and how can we maybe help solve it? All right, as a, as a combined industry. All right, so I wanna take a, a few moments here before going too far. Uh, I know at a conference like this, everybody knows APIs inside and out. Not everybody's familiar with GraphQL, but some people are very, very familiar. So I'll just take a, a, a several slides to go very quickly, uh, two slides through what GraphQL is for anybody who's new so you know how to look at the rest of the presentation. Uh, here's the what first step of GraphQL is that the, the provider, the API provider, gives a schema of what they support, right? There's that design time. They're saying that they support in their server. In this case, I have a type query. That's what you can query for. Uh, then which one? There's the me field, which returns a user. So that means maybe it looks me up based on an OAuth bearer token or something like that. It will figure out who the authenticate the user really is, who they claim to be, and then look up the user record in the backend database. With that user record from the backend database, it will be able to just fetch from that JSON data uh, some name and age of the user. 
when the client goes to send the query, now we're ready at runtime. The query is sent, and I say, I want me. And uh, Alice asks for her name. She doesn't need to know her age. She just wants to know her name now. And then the response comes back. And notice that it's very much, it looks like the, uh, like the query, right? It's very much parallel. I see the me to the me, the name to the name. All right, one step more complication here. Let's look at nested queries. There's no explicit join, but obviously this is a join on the backend database, even though GraphQL expresses it as, uh, as a nesting. So here I'm asking for me, it's Alice again. This time she chooses to ask for both her name and her age. Uh, GraphQL is very flexible for the client, and she's asking for her friends uh, and their names. So when the server is running the GraphQL execution engine, the me, again, is going to figure out who she really is, authenticate her, look up the user record in the database, get back that record. Now, the record's in memory, so it's very easy to look up the name and just pull it from this JSON object, pull the age right over. When you get to friends, it gets a, a little more complicated. Probably friends is an array of indexes of the friends, so indices, so that I can re look it up recursively in that same table. That's our join. Uh, and so here, the GraphQL execution engine will look up the friends, get each of the IDs, look them up in the table, and have an array of, uh, of friend records. And then name is pretty easy. It just takes the name from each one of those records. Uh, so here we've seen very quickly what GraphQL looks like. You see the client's really in control. Uh, and it's much more than this. The client can reorder fields, can rename fields, can decide which fields they want, which fields they don't want. The client is in control of the request response contract here. We'll get to in a moment. Um, now that we know what GraphQL is, uh, we're up to speed. The, this is a picture of the standard open source GraphQL client, uh, UI client. When you're actually sending GraphQL transactions, you don't send, you don't go to the client every time, you just send them uh, uh, over a HTTP. But when you're trying to develop them, there's this nice UI to help you, which, and there are many, many different versions of it. GraphQL Playground is, is a very common one. This is base graphical, Graph IQL. Uh, what it does when it starts up is it can automatically introspect what's available from the server. And once it learned all the types and fields and directives and things available at the server, then it can use that to give a very deep, uh, rich integration specific to my server and my schema to the, to the user on, in the left-hand pane. Uh, so what do you notice in the left-hand pane? One thing is you see that it's got some tactic font coloring, but again, specific knowing what the what the different types of fields, what, what's available, what they are from my schema. Uh, it got autocomplete to help me finish typing in strings and let me know what's what's available. Context where help, like you see the pop-up window here showing me the, the documentation, the human readable string that's stored on the server up to the minute fetched from the server that I can I can hover over and see as I'm editing. And it's got local validation. So at every point that I'm typing, it sees whether my query is legal. If not, it tells me why not and helps me fix it up. And when I'm all ready, then it lets me send the request and you see that I get very similar data back. Um, all right, so uh, we'll come back to this in, in just a moment. I want to talk about one of the high level advantages of GraphQL. So I already mentioned that the main principle of GraphQL is that the client is in control. Right? The client should, should do everything to let the client get optimized as much as they want. One of the parts of this is showing them what they, what they can get, like we did just now in the, in the UI. Another part, as I mentioned, is that they control the request response contract. That's extremely valuable. It means that they don't have to do 10 uh, round trips or two round trips where they can just do one by specifying what they want. It means that they don't have to uh, post-process the data before they, they use it in their, in their UI framework because they've been able to request the data in the exact form that their, their specific UI wants it, uh, things like that. But obviously, the client being complete control of on every transaction can do different things. And the request response contract is a, may also a major risk. It's a major advantage, but it comes with a major challenge. Consider this query on the top left. I'm asking for a bunch of data from a backend database. I say, give me the users, the first uh, only 1,000 users. I want to limit it so I don't get 100,000 users back. For every one of those users, give me his first 1,000 orders. Not all those orders, but up to 1,000. Uh, and then for every one of those orders, give me the payment details. I want to know updated status from the credit card company. Is it Has it cleared? Is, is, the, is it all paid up? Uh, am I still awaiting payment? What, what's happening? Uh, maybe that payment details is fetched externally 
from a third party, uh, maybe I, I've got a, some contract where I can send the RESTful request over to the credit card company and get that data or something like that. Uh, so what's going to happen when I run this? If there's only one user who has one order, I'm only going to get one payment details back. But it should be pretty clear that I might get up to a million payment details. And so if that's a third party call, I might be getting up to a million times that I'm making that third party call, which whether it was malicious or not, this is an out of control query. So how can I protect that? Protect myself against that. Uh, many approaches have been around for years with GraphQL. One approach is to have a timeout, uh, which is effective. I say I only go 300 milliseconds after that, I won't be executing a single query anymore. But obviously, I may not care about the time as much as I care about that payment details as going external, uh, maybe costing me real money. So I could instead dynamically sum up the parts I care about. I could ignore the users and orders, but dynamically keep a counter of how many times I've had to do payment details. If it goes over 500, then I slide abort the query. I stop. Uh, another approach is before I even run the query, I could do a static analysis and see how deep. Many people look at the depth of a GraphQL query to make sure that it doesn't get out of control, saying um, who, who are my users and which are their orders and who are the users who ordered those orders? And then what are the orders of those users? I could, I could recurse if I get a lot of depth. Uh, or I could do a more general cost analysis, trying to figure out how much CPU memory or money is it going to cost on my backend to run this query before I even run it. Well, the first three of these are pretty easy to implement. The, uh, every field in a GraphQL query corresponds to a resolver function on the server. So I can just go into that resolver function and dynamically sum up cost. Or I can take the query when I first come in and count up the nesting depth. These things are very easy. The last one's very, very hard. But unfortunately, the first ones don't help us as much. And obviously, by the time I get to 300 milliseconds, or by the time I get to 500 times I've run payment details, I've already wasted a lot of effort. And if there is a denial of service attack, it's gotten a long way before I've cut it off. So I really do think we need to statically analyze uh, do static analysis to statically analyze the query before we run it. And things like the nesting depth and nesting width are really good to do. So we would recommend doing it. But if you look at the query at the top left, it's a depth of four and a width of one, uh, max width of one. So I wouldn't cut it off for its net depth or for its width. And yet I need to cut it off. Uh, and so really, there's not a good substitute. We need to do a full cost analysis. Uh, to point out that this is a real problem, I think anybody who's looked at a lot of public GraphQL endpoints, say GitHub is the most famous one, you notice it, it's big. It's got single types with many, many, many fields, so you could have a lot of width. It's got a whole lot of different connections. You can have lots of depth of, of querying for issues and their PRs and their comments, et cetera. Uh, and this, this picture happens to be from the GitHub API for one small corner of the IBM cloud. Uh, but like I said, any public endpoint is the same where there's just a lot of connections. So it's a real world problem. All right. So if it, if it is a real world problem, then every major public graphical endpoint must have solved this problem by now, right? It can't be, uh, we couldn't be leaving it out there and yet have big companies uh, exposing endpoints that are leaving open risks like that. So then the question is, how do these big companies solve this problem today? Right? In particular, I want to look at three, three avenues. Number one is threat protection. Threat protection means taking a single query in, single request, and saying that transaction is out of control, and I'm going to cut it off before it even starts. Number two is rate limiting. Rate limiting means this no one transaction is a problem. But I don't want to let a single API consumer give me too many requests. Because if so, if they give me uh, overload my servers too much, it'll, it'll take away bandwidth. It'll take away a CPU on my backend memory that I should have been spending on other customers. So I don't want one customer to take over. So I'll, I'll use, that's one of the reasons you would use rate limiting. Right? And notice today, we do rate limiting. But we say rate limiting for REST as 100 per second, 100 transactions per second. Uh, for GraphQL, where one transaction can be tiny or humongous, that's not going to help. I have to do rate limiting in a more, a more GraphQL-focused way. Right? And finally, monetization. When you have APIs, you have big public endpoints, generally people are charging for that. And I want to make sure that somebody who uses tons more 
of my resources is getting charged somewhat more money. Okay. All right, so I want to look at these three in the context of the three most famous big public open graph billing points today. Uh, each one does more than one item. GitHub is not limited to threat protection for sure. Uh, Yelp's not limited to rate limiting, et cetera. But I'm just going to look specifically at GitHub and what they publicly document. You can go look up on uh, with the link I give you on, in their do documentation on the web, what GitHub does for threat protection, what Yelp does for rate limiting, and what Shopify does for monetization. Right? So this is a screenshot from GitHub's documentation. They tell you that you must be using the first and last slicing arguments. This matches the relay connections pattern uh, standard. You match the pagination uh, pattern that's that's explained by the on the GraphQL learn GraphQL Foundation learn pages. Right? To to say that I've got a connection, I can go paginate through it. I'll tell you how many objects I want at a time with either a first or a last argument. GitHub says you must use them. Not only do you have to use them, but their values must never be greater than 100 each. And not only should each one not be greater than 100, but all of your nesting and stuff combined, if you get back the maximum number that you're asking for in each part, cannot add up to a total of more than half a million nodes. Right? Uh, and if you did, they reject the transaction with threat protection, and you don't get it at all. Right? Yelp gives you this nice table telling you that different parts of their schema, different parts of their graph are have different costs to them. So business is 10 points of value as opposed to user is only one point of value, right? And somewhere in the middle location is five points of value. They'll add up all of the points that you're, you as an API consumer are using through the day. And if it exceeds more than a quarter million points, they'll cut you off for the rest of the day until midnight GMT the next day when you, when you get your two quarter million points refunded again. Right, so we see the rate limiting is not based on transactions per second because that wouldn't make any sense with GraphQL. It's based on GraphQL points per second, which is which is different number of points for different parts of the scheme. Right. Similarly, Shopify, uh, and this one I, is not merely a screenshot, but I modified it. And notice at the bottom of the screen, they're telling you that mutations have a cost of 10. Uh, by default, some might be different. And connection fields have a cost of 2. But then they add the number of objects, which they know how many objects because of those first and last arguments again, which you must use. Uh, and then once they add up all the number of points, they're going to give you, if you're on the standard limit, 50 points per second, or on the enterprise limit, then 100 points per second. Uh, the thing I did to modify the screenshot is only that I added the, the prices based on something I found on their website. I don't guarantee their prices. It's up to them how much money they charge. Uh, the point here for our purposes is not the dollars, but just knowing that there is a different number of dollars, that it is a monetization feature, that they're charging more for more points per second. But as we mentioned previously, it can't be for more transactions per second, because in GraphQL, that's meaningless. I could stuff 10 times as much work in half as many transactions. It has to be how many points per second. right? And then that's how that, that enables monetization. All right, so we've looked at these three examples on the three previous slides. What's in common between GitHub, Yelp, and Shopify? Well, one thing is they all have custom code for enforcement of these kind of limits for GraphQL that are specific to GraphQL uh, and calculating cost for GraphQL queries. And then number two is that they have custom documentation for their users. And the way for, as a user to know how much am I going to get charged to understand, given my exact query, how much rate am I going to get per day, I have to go to the web page to try to add it up. Right. Uh, so this means that as a user of these APIs, first I look at something like Graphical or Graphical Playgrounds, etc., and I have a nice integrated, rich editing environment where, as I enter my query, it tells me what my uh, it tells I tell me about types and fields that are available and what exactly what's available in endpoint. The Graphical Promise, the Graphical Dream. And then when I want to know how many of these I'm going to get through per second, or can this single query get through threat protection, or at which level of the API plan do I need to buy for monetization, then I go to a web page, a static web page, to help me figure that out. So the picture on the left is clearly the GraphQL dream. The picture on the right clearly does not uh, follow through on that GraphQL dream. So that's where we come in saying, we think we can do better. Right? What typical topology of a GraphQL uh, environment here, there's a client. We go through one or more, zero or more middleware levels, and we get to the, the server, which might have middleware in it, 
and eventually runs the GraphQL execution engine. The client controls the contract. They get to decide what they're asking for, and they want to know how costly or how expensive it's going to be before they ask. The middleware wants to be able to enforce threat protection, rate limiting, and monetization based on the actual cost of the query. And the server might also enforce those things in an uh, internal middleware level in the server. And it also wants to be able to express how expensive things are. The server is the one who bears the brunt of that cost and wants to be able to, to assert how costly a given query is, how costly different parts of the graph are. Right. So overall, what does that mean we need to do? That means our goals of the spec are that the server should be able to express, this is number one, the server should be able to express the cost of each part of the schema. And then number two, anybody, client, middleware server, should be able to calculate the cost of a query given on what the server has expressed in the schema. Right? If I think about this in terms of what's out there today, note that it's actually just parallel to everything we already have. So we already have the server providing a schema that explains all of my types and fields and what's available. We already have the middleware enforcing validation based on that. So if the client comes through and asks for a field that doesn't exist or gives the wrong type, something like that for, a, for an input argument, then the middleware will feel perfectly OK with saying that's not a valid query and returning it to the client as invalid as a 400 error with it never getting to the backend server. Right? And the client also can use all that information in the schema to expose a much richer experience in the UI. What we're talking about with this spec is extending the server that while it's explaining all about its types and fields and other parts of the schema, it also expresses their cost. The middleware gets to also validate based on the cost and enforce things like rate limits. And then the client gets to express those costs to the user in a nice graphical way while you're in the UI. So I mentioned that there are two fundamental things we do. Number one, how do we change the schema to express the cost? Number two, how do we use that in any, at any level to calculate the cost of an overall query? Right? When we're looking at the schema, the, the first thing that this spec uh, provides us is the at cost directive. The problem it's trying to solve is to say, and, and um, this slide I want to talk about applying it to, to types, sorry, to specifically the GraphQL types. So the problem I'm trying to tackle here is how costly or how expensive is that type? Types control the GraphQL data that's returned. Every type that's returned means another JSON object or JSON scalar that's returned. So type cost roughly corresponds to the data, maybe how big it is or how expensive it is that data getting returned, could be cor correlated to the expense of fetching that data on the back end. Here's a subset of schema. Uh, I've got this bank schema that I use the rest of the presentation. The first type here is address. It's a pretty normal type. It's got a bunch of scalar fields, nothing fancy. So maybe I'll call it cost three. And you see I've updated that directly in the schema. Uh, the next one's credit card. Now I'm going to assume that credit card is actually interacting I to, to fulfill this, to get the data about the credit card. I need to ask a third party server. And so let's say I've got a limited SLA with them. If my clients ask me about credit cards too often, I would end up needing to pay more to my th third party contact here. Therefore, I'm going to increase the cost here so that only clients that are paying me more money can force me to spend more money. Right? So I'll use a cost of 13. And finally, account connection. This is part of the connections pattern. By default, it would also have a cost of one, but I'll set it at cost zero and only charge for the actual leaf nodes, not the connection pattern uh, intermediate nodes. Uh, I could have done that differently. Any of these choices could be different. The point here is not the actual costs. The point here is that with me knowing, that API provider knowing the values of how expensive stuff really is in the backend schema, backend server, then that API provider can express those costs here in the schema. All right, let's next look at field cost. It's still applying the cost directive, but to fields. Fields, as we already discussed, one-to-one -one correspond to uh, resolver functions on the backend server. So every field is corresponding to a resolver function. And how costly a field is, one-to-one -one corresponds to how expensive is it to run that resolver function on that field. And the expense might be because it takes a lot of CPU to run the resolver function. Maybe it's doing uh, some aggregation or something like that. It might correspond to how much memory is used in, uh, when, you, when you need to use that field. 
It could mean I'm spending actual money with a third party when, you, when I need to resolve that field. Right? Whatever it is, it's got a cost. So here's an example of the account type in my schema. One of the fields is trans, uh, joint owner. Joint owner, I'm going to assume for the purpose of this slide it, that the, the joint owner of the bank account is stored in a different geography. So my main company is in, in Asia and Hong Kong, and the, but the joint owner for some reason is stored in Europe or in the Americas or something. So it's going to cost me a bunch of time waiting with my data memory while I wait for the response from the other server in a different geography. And therefore, I'll give it a cost of five. Transactions, this is the most commonly used uh, thing in the entire mobile banking app. You got any mobile banking app, you go into your mobile banking, the first thing, and the second thing, and the third thing you do are to check out the most recent transactions in your, in your account. You want to see whether accounts are posted. You want to see what, what you've done recently. And so this has been optimized by the bank. This is a fictional bank. But uh, but fictionally, they've been optimizing it for decades. They've put in stored procedures. They've optimized the database schema. They've hired people to do all kinds of optimizations on this. And so it's not going to cost me much to run it, so I give it a cost of one. Finally, family members is a different kind of cost. It's sensitive information. Some people need to know who the family members of the, of the owner of the account are so that they can use that information. But that's sensitive personal information. So it might need to be encrypted. Uh, and encrypting means taking more CPU. It means taking more memory. So I'm going to give it a cost of seven. All right. Next problem I want to deal with, once I understand basic costs of different types of fields, I've got a big problem, which is that the GraphQL core standard itself does not give me any way to know how many elements we returned in a list. So when a list is returned, if it could be three things returned, or seven, or 100, or a million, every one of the types returned even if I know how much a single one of those types cost, if I don't know how many are coming back, I'm mean, going to have no idea how expensive my query is. And similarly, in those types, I could be querying fields. And if I don't know how many types objects I'm getting back, then I don't know how many times I'm querying those fields. So this could be you know, not bounding the list means I have absolutely no idea how expensive my query really is. I need to be able to bound my list. Let's look at the, this, again, the example of account transactions. Here it's using the standard relay pattern, pagination pattern. So it's using that first, those first and last arguments that we talked about, which are telling you, they're slicing arguments telling you how big the slice is that's returned. So what do I do is I augment my schema, uh, the at list size directive. Slicing arguments, here I say first and last. That means I'm saying both of these, they don't just happen to be inter integer arguments there. Each of first and last actually are slicing arguments controlling the size of the list return. And in this case, because it's the relay pattern, it's not. I'm not returning a, a list directly. I'm returning a transaction connection. And he, the transaction connection, returns a field called edges. And that's the list that, that's being sized. So I've got slicing arguments and sized fields. Uh, and note that while many people use first and last and relay and, and graphical pagination are standard patterns, uh, we've got many customers that don't. I mean, I've personally seen many uh, examples of schemas that use other things, they're sometimes nested inside various levels of, of input arguments or, or different kind of ways. So they, the slicing arguments might be named differently. Uh, the, the whether you use the connection pattern or not so that you've got offsets into where you're actually sizing. There are many different patterns we've seen here. Uh, and so to be able to generally specify this for GraphQL, we really need these arguments. Uh, also, besides using other forms of connection patterns, what about if somebody doesn't have slicing arguments at all? Looking at this schema here, this is where somebody has transactions. But they say, I'm not going to give the client control of how many are returned. right? Instead, I'm going to just say that I'll always return five. And I can't return as many as there might be. That might be too big. But I can give you five at a time and give you a cursor to control which five you want. Uh, so here I've got my, my uh, back end being control of the number. It's listed nowhere in the, in the schema. So what do I do is I add an assumed size argument to list size, which says, you can assume an upper bound of five. I'm never going to return more than five from the transaction. And I can combine these. I can have something, this one returns a list. So I need to also have the assumed size and also have the size fields. Right? Basically, there's a lot more to the spec, and I encourage you to go read the spec itself. But basically, these are the most common, um, most common features of what the spec lets you add to the schema. 
So then the next question is, once I've added to the schema, what is it that I get to, to, have, to do in other, other places? How do I use that knowledge to assess the cost of an overall query? So let's just do one example of static analysis here. The spec also talks about dynamic query analysis and query response analysis. But uh, as one example, let's look at static analysis before I run the query. So I start at the top. I see that I've got a query. I know that means that my root query type is named query. So I'm going to run get that type back. So I record that at the top right. Next, I get to account. So I know that I'm running the query dot account field. I record that at the bottom right. And at the top right, I add the account type because that's getting returned. Next is the name field. Name's a scalar. Uh, the spec does allow you to give that a weight. But by default, it says just assume that has no cost because it's probably just a scalar on an object you've already fetched from the, from the account uh, resolver function. And so we, we'll skip that over. Transactions, again, one and one at the right side. But it also has additional information. Remember, we annotated it in the schema saying that slicing arguments includes last. And so with this concrete query, that means I know that the slicing size is going to be five and that sized fields is edges. So I can record that and know that when I get to edges, it's going to be sized by five. Right? Page info is simple enough, one and one. I skip access, has next page as a scalar. When I get down to edges, here's the interesting part that I can apply the number five. So everything in the blue square is going to actually happen five times because I'm going to have five of those in the list. right? And notice on the right side that while the transaction connection that edges is only called once, the resolver function is executed once, it returns a list of five transaction edges. So I get five transaction edges at the top. And that means when I get down to node, I actually, I'm going to run that resolver function five times because I'm, I've run on five objects. And each time is going to return one transaction for a total of five transactions at the top right. right? That's the entire pass through this query. Uh, and now the only thing that's left is to sum up all my counts. I was really a weighted sum, right? I'm going to apply the, the cost of each of these elements to give a weighted sum. But for simplicity on the slide, so you guys can all do the math in your head, let's just assume that everything has a cost of 1, which means that a weighted sum is just a sum. So you see the top is a type cost of 14, and the bottom numbers add up to a field cost of 9. So that's how anybody with this additional information from the schema can figure out the cost of a query. Right. I want to show you a demo of how this can work, but briefly before the demo, let's talk about what, uh, how, like, why is this better, right? Uh, and and where the spec is. So why is it better? Basically, it's taking the kind of things that everybody has to do individually and formalizing a spec. That means we can interrupt. It means that there's no vendor lock-in. You can use one thing on your schema, a different vendor on your middleware or in your client, uh, and we can optimize each one independently. Right? You could be enforcing threat protection rate limiting modernization without needing to tie all these things together. Uh, for the spec itself, about uh, two months ago, we released this, uh, this landing page with an intro to the spec and a few videos about the spec, short uh, four-minute videos you can go watch. The, that first link links to the second link, the formal specification. We can read through all the details of exactly what it takes to implement the spec uh, or decide how you so you can know how to augment your schema yourself. And there is a link in there to discussion. You can go to that, that Slack. Uh, it's part of the GraphQL Foundation Slack workspace to discuss the spec with us. Or uh, so far, a uh, number of companies have all been contacting me personally, not through the, not through the uh, Slack there. You're also welcome to get my contact information from the conference and contact me personally. And we, we've already had two suggestions uh, from other companies who've been contacting us for, for slight for modifications in the spec. Uh, so we're we're trying to evolve the spec with everybody's feedback. So please join us. Uh, use use it to improve your expressivity of your schema and uh, and help us extend this for the whole industry. All right, with that I think I want to show you a quick demo here. All right. Uh, this is API Connect, which is a product that is is making use of the spec. You can see I've got a, oh, I want to show you first the view of the actual schema. I'm going to show you the table here. So if I look at the actual schema, the source, you can see I've got an account that we've been looking at uh, with a joint owner, transaction family members, no annotations from the spec yet. Right? But I can go into this table. I can, I can upload a new schema that will have them using the spec very directly. Or I can go here into the account and 
uh, and let this table adjust it. So joint owner, I think we said was five. So we can adjust that to five. Uh, family members, I said was seven. We can adjust to seven. And then if I view the source again, and I look at accounts, I see joint owners has a cost of five and family members of seven, right? So the spec has automatically been updated. Uh, another major problem we have, we talked about transactions for several slides, that there's no way to know how to bound the list. You see there's this warning icon here. So if I click on that, it tells me what my problem is. Very clearly, the value of this field is a list of the composite type, which has neither an assumed size nor slicing arguments. And why is that a problem? Because if it's encountered, the API gateway cannot set a limit on the number of objects that the server might return, right? So unbounded list, majorly problematic. Here we've got the suggestions, your little like uh, AI suggestions in order of highest likelihood first. And you've got uh, the, the top suggestion, the highest confidence is that you should add a last uh, list size with uh, lim the slicing arguments of first and last and the size fields of edges, right? That looks like everything we've been doing all the slides. It's clearly the correct one, but in case you are not using the connections pattern and you know, first was a slicing argument, but not last or something, we've got other suggestions there. Since this one's correct, I click, click apply. Once I click apply, you can see it's been added to the table, these values. And if I go back into the source, I can see that I've got not only the cost on joint order and transactions, that's right, and family members, but transactions here, I've got two slicing arguments first and last and size fields of edges. All right, that was not the only warning here. So if I look, I do have other warnings. I can click apply all to just apply all of the top rated suggestions. Uh, most of them are first last. In this case, the schema also has uh, family members, which if you notice on the slide is returning a list directly, not returning uh, a connections pattern. But it does have a slicing argument, and it's not lean first last, it's name limit. Uh, you want to be careful not to accept suggestions if they're not correct, but these are all correct. So I can just apply all of them. All right. Uh, now I'm all cleaned up. So I can save, and that will automatically republish to the server. Once it's published to the server, that means that all of my settings here are going to be effective when I go to a graphical that's trying to, uh, trying to help me edit a query. So here I've got the query. Notice that we've augmented the graphical. I, I've logged in. Let me tell you a couple of things I've done. One is that I've already logged into this with my credentials so that I'm getting my specific query limits. And for my API plan that I'm logged into, I've set the, the limits of, to a type cost of 1,000 per minute and a field cost of 1,000 per minute. So here, I've got a simple query that's only got one uh, resolver function, account is one field. And so therefore, with a cost of one, that's going to give me, I mean, I can do 1,000 per minute. But I've got two types, the query type overall and the account type that's returned here. So with two types, it's going to only be able to do 500 per minute, right? 500 per one minute down here at the bottom right because I've got a type cost of two, right? Just because the field cost would have been 1,000 per minute, the type cost is because uh, I got these two types, count and query is going to cost mean I can only run 500 per minute. Right. As I start editing, I can ask for other things in the account. We also talked about join owner a bunch. Uh, join owner, maybe I want the name. See what else is available. I also want the email. And we talked a bunch of times about the credit card. Right. Uh, talked about some things might be risky, might be more expensive, like credit card. So, so here I go. Now notice as I'm typing, the query limits are updating, and they're now down. Instead of 500 per minute, I'm only getting 142 per minute. So as an end user, not only is graphical filling in the types and fields and helping me with that, it's also helping me understand my, my limits, my what query limits I'm getting. Uh, that's for a little more. We also ask for transactions. I want to know if the last five transactions say. And uh, I need some actual data here. What do I want for each transaction? About the description, the amount, and uh, maybe that's enough. Right? So what am I at? I'm up to 66, down to 66 per minute that I can get. Right? Uh, the other thing to note is that I can also affect costs, you know, one, once I see this as an API provider or, you know, for the, for the consumer, obviously, it's before they come to it. 
So let's say credit card actually does go to the third party server, like I mentioned in the slides, and it's much more, much more expensive. Here I can go through and let's say it's 100, the type, type class going up to 100. Um, and I'll save, we'll republish, right? Because credit card, if you remember what I said before, we're assuming that credit card is in my GraphQL execution engine. I'm actually going off to a third party server and I've got an SLA with them. And if, so if my API consumer asks for enough credit card data, that means I'm gonna have to pay more to my third party provider. And therefore I wanna make sure that if I'm paying more, at least I was getting more money from the API consumer. So I'm gonna increase the cost here. And then when I go back, then I see now I'm down not 66, but I'm down to eight times per minute, right? And then as the API consumer, I've got a choice to say something like, well, I can figure out how where I'm spending money, erase the credit card, that's up to 71 times per minute, right? Put the credit card back, and I'm down to eight times per minute. So I can see that the amount of times I can query this endpoint is going to depend on what how how much I'm asking for. Am I asking for the credit card or not? Is a much bigger effect than just asking for more transactions. Um, but this the same goes with anything, right? So uh, yeah, I'll show that, right? Transactions is my my other thing. You know, maybe I say I don't need the credit card, so I'll erase that. But what if instead of five transactions, gosh, I would need a lot fewer round trips. That'd be better for me if I asked for uh, I don't know ten of them at once. But if I ask for ten at once, I can only do this forty one times per minute. So is that worth it for me as an API consumer or not? You're letting your API consumer have very rich, clear control immediately, obviously, of understanding how to form the queries in a way that will not tax your server, right? So, so you're 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 helping yourself here. All right, um, I think that's it for now. So we've got a few minutes left for questions. Uh, people, uh, people can let me know. Do you have uh, any questions in the chat? I can actually check the chat myself. No questions in the chat. All right. Um, nothing yet. Again, if you guys have any questions, please make sure to put it into the chat. You can also visit our booth in the Partners Village so you can find additional information and resources around this topic and some others. I'd also be interested for anybody who reads the spec, um, we have gotten some feedback from other companies reading the spec and telling us things that were unclear. So if anybody goes and reads the spec, can you tell me something that's not clear enough in it? We can try to fix that up. Yeah, you can ask questions. You can ask to join, so you can ask verbally, or you can just uh, just type your question in the chat. Put back up on the screen the links to, to go find the spec. You can always contact us through the conference. We can send you slides, which have these links, but you can also copy down these links now. Once again, if you guys are interested in asking a question, please post it to the chat. Morris, thank you again for doing your presentation and your workshop. We will be sharing this information and the uh, slides for those folks that requested it through the conference. All right. Thanks, everyone. If you if you come up with a question later, yeah, feel free to contact me. You can find out from the conference how to contact me, or in the conference directly. If you click on it, you can find my LinkedIn and Twitter information, stuff like that. Uh, or contact through the IBM booth. You can you can uh, get get a message through to me. Uh, love to help. <laughs> thanks, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day.
No, thank you, Eric.